Valley, the Silicon Valley, is a world of first names. In his comments earlier today, former FCC Chairman Michael Powell talked about Mark, Larry, and Sergi. And well before Mark, Larry, and Sergi, of course, there was Steve, a different Larry, and Scott. Um, Scott McNeely is one of the co-founders of Sun Microsystems, and as his bio says, took it from a startup to the dominant force in network computing in the United States and the world uh, in a very short period of time. That's what the bio says. Is that right? Uh, yeah, if, if it says it, that's true. Somebody yeah. got that part right. All right, so uh, Scott has generously agreed that we're going to have a very free-ranging conversation today. We're going to save some time for audience questions as well. We're going to talk a little bit about the past. We're going to talk a little bit about the marketplace for higher ed, some of his current activities and we'll go into a couple of other areas. So uh, bear with us, be patient with us, uh, and let the fun begin. So Scott, let me begin talking about Sun. Uh, Sun grew out of a university experience. Uh, certainly higher ed was an important, probably not the largest revenue generating client for, for Sun, but strategically and for other reasons. What were some of the interesting things about dealing with higher ed, and what were some of the difficult things about dealing with higher ed as a market for technology products and services? Well. Sun was a computer company. We did chips and operating systems and computers. So uh, universities tended to like the high performance component. So we would take and, and go after the, the high performance computing marketplace and then use Moore's Law to put that in your, your thumb drive. So you know, fundamentally, if we could win there, we would learn the architectures and what needed to be done. So it was a very valuable lab for us to, to bring high performance. And if you think about this versus the first Apple II, it's, 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 you can see that uh, this would have been the world's greatest supercomputer back then. Uh, so that was one thing. We also noticed that on the administrative side, because you were dealing with public sector buying typically and in large bureaucratic buying, that it, was ten, it tended to be four or five generations behind the state of the art, uh, if not more. So that was always challenging to get the administrative and teaching sides uh, to, to think about moving forward, uh, whereas you could get the, the technical and scientific and lab sides, uh, you, you know, you couldn't get them to do anything that you could buy off the shelf. You had to invent something new. So it was sort of weird. What we were selling, the administration didn't want, nor did the technical side. So it was, it was complicated. So uh, let's talk about that part of it a little bit. Higher Ed has a reputation among at least a number of the firms that I work with as being a really difficult client compared to other sectors. It can be an engaging client, you deal with a lot of smart people, but you talked about the bureaucracy, you talked a little bit about the lag. Higher Ed is a, is a great client, it's a wonderful client, you meet nice people, but it's a pain in the ass client. Is that true? I would, I, and it wasn't their fault, it was just they had congressional like buying policies and regulations and constraints with school budgets. So they had no money, and uh, <laughs> what little money they did required an enormous selling process. So you had to be really dedicated. We, we had to operate our uh, education group at, basically, we tried to run them at break even. And we said maximize revenue, but go at break even. And so that actually ends up uh, making schools get trapped into very proprietary uh, and monopoly owned strategies that and we all know that monopolies don't evolve their technology quickly so they didn't have enough money to actually not make smart decisions but to make correct decisions they kind of had to go with who gave them the stuff uh, and Microsoft gave a lot of software away for free you know the first hit is free <laughs> right and 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 so it, it, was a, it was a tough marketplace. We did very well in it. In fact, uh, we had a, a multi-billion dollar business that actually broke even, which was a lot better than most people did. A multi-billion dollar business that broke even. Yeah. All right, so that, that's a, a cautionary tale for many folks who want to yeah. come to this so, market. So, you know, I think if education was released from the clutches of the not too big to fail, but too big to ever succeed, public sector, then we'd have a very, very different uh, level of innovation from a technology perspective in it. But, uh, you know, governments, public sectors, and I'm going to probably make some enemies here and half the room might leave. You know, you don't have a reputation for being outspoken. Yeah, I'm bashful now in my old right. age. But, you know, the public sector doesn't prosecute anything it does efficiently, effectively, and without enormous 
bureaucracy and lots of corruption. I'm sorry, that's just, it, it's beyond political. And that goes right to war. I don't think we prosecute war very efficiently, effectively, and there's a lot of collateral damage and people die. So, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't want to go do it. It's just, I'm just not sure education belongs in the public sector uh, any more than my health care belongs in the public sector, but now the libertarian in me is, is seeping out badly. But if I look back on my several decades of selling technology into the public sector, I mean, uh, the education market, um, the, the similarities are, are stunningly, you know, it's the, it's the $500 hammer that took six years to procure, and that's what you guys are having to face. Uh, in, in, in the education marketplace. This, this may be a bit too academic in a question, but was there a difference between dealing with truly public sector institutions as opposed to private nonprofits? Stanford, you know, lots of institutions that Sun worked with were private nonprofits, others were public. Is it too nuanced a question or is it essentially? It, it's, it's a little bit the same. I mean, uh, it, it is fascinating to see uh, nothing worse than an endowment that's no longer run by the person who endowed it. Uh, and, <laughs> and my wife and I have agreed that we want to try and spend all of our foundation money before we die for fear it turns into one of these XYZ foundations where I got to believe there's enormous numbers of, of, of uh, rotisseries in cemeteries everywhere as, you know, interred people are turning over and over and over in their grave going, my foundation is doing what? And, and if you look at what universities tend to do is they tend to be building skyscrapers as opposed to building systems. And my wife and I are having a huge argument with our high school. They want to go out and buy a brand new campus. I just asked my 13-year-old, what do you think about it? I love my campus, he says. The last thing they need is more buildings. But they want to own their own building. They want to have a nice monument. Uh, and To potential donors. And what I'm thinking is they need to continue to drive technology and curriculum and out of classroom experiences, not in classroom experiences for our kids. So it, it's just an interesting battle. So I think technology gets way the short shrift at, uh, at uh, these institutions. And, and you know what do the donors want to do? They want to get their name on the uh, the Gates Engineering Center at Stanford University. Uh, not. <laughs> okay. There's there's no McNeely Engineering Center. Not yet. Not yet. Don't yeah. hold your breath. Don't. Okay. Just for all the folks that we're going to line up, we're going to take some questions along the way. So they should not be lining up to talk with you afterwards to pitch no, you for the Engineering no. Center. Yeah. You know, Sun was at the center in many ways, of sort of the dot-com experience. And you know, a lot of analysts look at the, the landscape today in the world of apps and other things and say, is this a revisiting of what we experienced a decade or so ago? What's your take on that? It's very different this time. Uh, How? Well, in fact, there have been many, many waves. I'm an old guy, so I actually was there right about the time when we started doing transistors and Fairchild. And then the next wave was we actually uh, moved you know, out of the Fairchild Intel world to actually doing, uh, you know, chips and, and integrated into things like disk drives and motherboards and then we did computers and, uh, and then we went into hosting and then services and now we're kind of into social networks and that's what the valley's all about. It's the Zyngas and the, and, you know, the Angry Birds and uh, all of those other things and Facebooks, you know, relationship status, that's really key. It used to be kind of a secret now. It's a digital tattoo that uh, is out there, and you know the the thing that's different about this is back in the old days to do silicon required lots of jobs. I think the scary thing about social networking is it doesn't take a lot of jobs, uh, and in fact, probably a lot of people would argue might be a little bit of a productivity decreaser. Kind of like I used to claim Microsoft Office might have been the one greatest uh, sand in the gears of national productivity that we've ever had. Uh, and so I worry that we're not really inventing, I, I guess I come from making things. My first job was in a manufacturing plant and I like to see us make things. And, and I think that's, that's important. Not that ideas aren't important, but I think the, the router and the switch is far more important than Angry Birds. Uh, and, and I think that will, will drive uh, a very, very different discussion. So I think the, the valleys, now biotech and some of the other things 
that they're doing are, are, are very mm -hmm. valuable. But I, I find now here I am doing a social networking company too, with weigh in. So, uh, but but I, I think I can justify that, or shall I say, rationalize that <laughs> a little more. All right. So biotech, informatics, other areas that you think actually are are more worthy than the social networking stuff. I think anything that is building a. a Product. I think manufacturing, I think actually doing things, it gets very, very hard to do with the uh, wage laws and restrictions, with the health care mandates, uh, and most importantly, I just read an article where uh, uh, in the local San Jose Mercury News, which doesn't have a clue, said that, you know, there's a big problem that teenagers can't get jobs. Well, duh. If we eliminated minimum wage, First of all, there'd be a lot more jobs for everybody, and jobs would come flying into our country as opposed to flying out of our country, and the cost of living for all of us would drop because the cost of all goods and services, so there's a huge win, and then we'd be exporting a heck of a lot more instead of importing like we do. There's just this massive spiral, but take that one away. Let's just go to a minimum wage elimination for anybody 21 and under, and you'll have people working, and then we could actually put the kids to work in production jobs, actually building things, and we can start exporting. But that's my biggest worry, is that we have turned into the information society, but I'm not sure that there aren't a lot more brains in China, and you know that's, that's not necessarily a war you win. So I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. I don't know. I, I don't want to be a crusty old guy that's a little little negative, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to teach my children Mandarin right now. As opposed to having them spend time on Facebook? They, none of them have Facebook accounts. They, they, do, have, they do have weigh-in accounts, but uh, none of them have Facebook accounts. That, as a parent that you know of? Uh, we're pretty, we have all their passwords. <laughs> we know. So you are, are, are a command and control kind of guy in terms of, uh, as the CIO of the Command media. and control doesn't even get close to how my <laughs> wife and I manage our children. All right. All right, so you've given me the segue. Let, let me give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, both Way In and Kariki. The floor is yours. Be shamelessly self-promoting. All right, well, let me first of all talk about Kariki because I, I believe in the written and spoken language of computing ought to be open and free and not controlled by any single technology company uh, in the same way that, I mean, I wish I owned English. I wish I owned just the vowels. <laughs> All right, and, and I could charge you if you spoke it, wrote it, read it, used it in any way, shape, or form. And I wouldn't charge a lot, but you know, if, if I, I wouldn't even mind if it's just why. I just like to own why, even though it's not a regular vowel. And I can make a lot of money on it. And I think that uh, you know, that's very, very uh, critical. And which is why Sun, you know, as a top 40 R&D player globally, any industry, any technology, open source an enormous portfolio of, of technology because we just thought it was enabling and it was the right thing to do. I was a good capitalist, not a great capitalist. Larry's a great capitalist, Larry Ellison. Uh, so he now owns or, uh, uh, Sun Technology and he's not exactly pushing this sharing thing. Sharing's not, uh, I think that was a third year college class and he dropped out before then. <laughs> so, um, so uh, my head of worldwide education and I were sitting around in um, Italy uh, at an education conference and we thought, why are we open sourcing spreadsheets, operating systems, word processors, all that other stuff? And, and after doing a little research, we figured out there's 8 to $15 billion a year spent in the U.S. annually, once a year, every year on curriculum and associated learning materials just for K through 12, just in the U.S. Now, literally, as I am working hard to raise about 100 to $200 million, which I think if we can get that, we can create an entire K-12 through curriculum, self-paced, online, on-demand, free, open source, internet-enabled, real-time scored, web-enabled, multimedia, and everybody could use it for free in the United States, in fact, on the planet. And for, I mean, can you think about an ROI greater than a couple hundred million dollars to wipe out $15 billion annual fees, annual fees, recurring fees. I went to um, Secretary, was it Sperling before? Uh, Spelling, Spelling, thank you. Uh, when when uh, Bush was in there and 
I said, what do you think of that? She says, great, good luck. I said, well, can, we, can the DOE help at all? Uh, no, it's all allocated. Doesn't this seem like a national good? Wouldn't that seem like something that, you know, and it's not like I... So then I went to go see Arnie Duncan. Same sort of thing. Looked at me like, a puppy heard a new sound. You want me to do what? So my vote is eliminate the DOE immediately, entirely, completely. Shut it down. But that's another libertarian in, uh, streak in me that's just... Do you have two great. others that go with that? Can you name them? Uh, <laughs> yeah. That was a great moment, wasn't it? Yeah. I, the, the bigger question is, which three should we keep? But uh, that's another conversation. Um, so anyhow, we, we just started uh, Curriki, and we spun it out of Sun. We now have 45,000 learning assets, free and open source, on the, under the uh, Creative Commons uh, attribution license. It's all free. AT&T hosts it on their website for free for us. Huge. Buy AT&T phones. Make AT&T phone calls because they've been very helpful to this effort. Uh, we have a great group of donors, including people like Gordon Moore from Intel and uh, Andy Bechtelsheim, uh, founder of Sun, and other people as well as our foundation have all been investing in this thing. We have uh, uh, about 150 countries who have visited our site. We get millions of visitors every year who are using this. Uh, the Khan Academy is hosted on our site because we're allowed into schools, whereas YouTube is not. Uh, we, we edit and curate everything to make sure it's safe for K through 12. And uh, we're only limited by the funding we get because people are trying to throw stuff on our site and we need to grab it, load it, ta uh, tag it, curate it, uh, and, and vet it, all the rest of it. And, uh, continue to update the site. So that's what we're doing. It's a great resource, and I encourage all of you to go look at it. It's got everything from textbooks to curriculum to uh, science projects to worksheets and every kind of supplemental learning uh, asset that you could want to use uh, on the website, did I mention, free. So uh, that's what we're doing Let there. me stop you on this one, though, because you just used a key word, and that was supplemental. The, you know, there's a huge, rich array of supplemental, the Kiriki stuff, Khan, lots of other stuff that, that people do. But a few moments ago, you also talked about a kind of a gestalt. Let's take all these little pieces and make them into a full, comprehensive, crate, if not cradle to grave, then K to, to high school right. kind of program. Um, it reminds me of a comment Peter Drucker made in a famous Forbes interview in 1997, where Drucker said, you know, higher education is hopelessly out of date, College campuses are effectively useless. And even in 1997, when he was really talking more about airwaves and broadband, he says, we're pushing more stuff over the air than we are, and we're doing it more effectively. And I think that many of us saw that. And you know, Drucker was a, certainly uh, liked to throw little things out there to, to, to age, probably, yeah, yeah. sort of get people going. And yet at the same time, the question becomes, and I think it's a fair one, well, where did Drucker want his great-grandchildren to go to college on the trust fund? Was it? You know, sort of the online places that sort of pointed to where he was talking about in the Forbes interview, or was it Bennington, NYU, and the Claremont Colleges, these very kind of small, unique, high-touch places where he had spent his professional career. So on the supplemental side, I don't think you get much argument with a lot of folks. When you talk about aggregating all those things into a complete, comprehensive, turnkey K-12 through, K through 12, you know, the question is, you know, very directly, do you want your kids to have, sort of live in the online environment exclusively, or do you want them to have benefit to the rich supplements? So there's, we have this, I call Curriki a box, a huge drum of Lego blocks. And literally you could build five trillion different K through 12 curricula creations out of these Lego blocks. And depending on whether you believed in evolution or creationism, whether you believe how the Japanese felt about the Chinese-Japanese wars or how the Chinese felt about it. I mean, you can do revisionist history with these things. You can edit and update. You can make it STEM-oriented. You can make it liberal arts-oriented. You could make it, you know, however you want out of all these building blocks. What would we do with money is we try and build higher level components than just the little pieces that we've got. And we just don't have the money to go do that. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we're slowly doing that. 
I mean, it's happening. There's way better pieces and sub-assemblies, if you will, uh, to building out curriculum than we had uh, over over time. But ultimately, but you're also doing vetting in QA. In yes, this yeah, and basically, you know, we're we're buried because people are all inventing all these great little components, these Lego blocks, and they have no way to distribute them. And so we end up being kind of the brand that you go and the search engine where these things can be found. So when there was a tsunami uh, in Japan, tsunami was there right on the front page, all of the tsunami, bay, you know, what causes an earthquake, what caused, kids wanted to know. They were freaked out. They wanted to know. They wanted to understand the science of what happened. And the teachers wanted supplemental tools. So that was part of it. But they, why not have a full K through 12 curriculum hosted free, open source, online, and the real challenge is with, you know, the United States, there's how many certification processes do you have, you know, how many school districts, and, you know, do you go to the national standards, the local standards, or the teacher standards? And, you know, that makes it all very, very complicated uh, to, go, to go make that happen. There are people in this room that would not let me, you know, will, will take me to task if I don't take you to task for one thing you just said, though. Um, evolution versus Darwinism, given, given the conversation about the, the need for STEM training in the United States uh, in, in terms of the vetting that you're doing. It, 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 why don't you talk about that? Because I think that for a lot of folks that are committed to science education, committed to enhancing the workforce, you know, the, the notion that creationism is part of a, curri a curriculum of science would raise a very large red flag. I said a K through 12 curriculum. I didn't say a science curriculum. So, I mean, All right. you know, again, I, I'm not going to get into that debate, you know, quietly. I'll be happy to tell you where I come down on all that. But uh, I'm no more of an expert than anybody else in this room. Uh, so, uh, you know, but we allow for uh, the beauty of this is we allow for people to, you know, if there's a, a, a Catholic school that wants to teach it this way and a non-denominational school that wants to teach it that way. We want to at least allow people to cut and paste what they want. Uh, we don't want to, you know, we don't, we want the Chinese to feel free to, you know, change the, the curriculum if they so choose. I'm, we're not, we're not in the business of deciding what the answers are. We're just out there providing all the Lego blocks to go make that happen. Uh, now, so you brought up another interesting point that, uh, again, my wife was over in the corner, raise your hand, so she knows who I'm talking is, about. Is she signaling you you're this, doing well? This was, no, this I, was I, like, I, don't you dare mention me again, is what that <laughs> was. But um, are you, Is he doing well, or does he need to do better? Okay. So we've actually, we have, a, we have a junior in high school, and we've had serious, as crazy as this sounds, serious conversations about, does it really make sense to go to college? What do you want to be when you grow up? If you want to be a doctor, you got to continue on. If you want to be a physicist, you got to continue on. But you know what? I've looked at his stuff as halfway through his junior year. He's, he knows more math than I ever, ever understood. And uh, I'm bragging here. I got an 800 on my math SAT, right? And I will tell you, I've had a pretty successful career. I've used none of my math that I learned past seventh grade. Honestly, I've used none of it. He's a better writer now than I am. And I've been writing my whole life. And I've written a lot of good stuff, and people say I write pretty well, right? He knows more world history than I ever knew. I don't know what, he's the, the school, he's a very bright kid. And I look at him and I say, there is nothing you're going to learn at school except maybe some accounting vocabulary and conventions. But you know what? You can hire somebody to do that for you. <laughs> that if he wants to go into business and start a business, all the rest of it, all he's doing is wasting four years, uh, you know, tempting alcoholism uh, <laughs> and unwanted pregnancies. So I, I read on the internet that that happens occasionally. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and by the way, you know, I look at it, Gates, Balmer, I believe Ellison, uh, Jobs, none of these guys finished. Andy Bechtelsheim and Bill Joy, the two smartest guys I had at Sun Microsystems, they didn't finish their, their degrees. And I think, well, and then you look at the cost, all the rest of it, I said, just get into Stanford and then tell everybody I got in and I told them no. Because what's the hardest part about Stanford? Getting in. And then just start working. I mean, talk about, talk about a scholarship. He
he's actually off daddy's payroll at the age of 17. And you know what? He's got an enormous amount of energy. He's incredibly mature. And so, you know, yeah, you what know, is the value? I mean, it, it, so I think co most colleges are turning into be libraries attached to football teams. Yeah, just in Division One, but. <laughs> <laughs> But with due respect, I mean, your profile of your son, and we all feel that way about our children, sort of makes you the one or one of three or four successful parents in the room. In the large population of the, there's 18 million college students, but only four and a half of them are really traditional college age in terms of 18 to 22. If they're not ready, I wouldn't send them to college. If they're not ready for a job, why would you dare send them away? Because, you know, I don't really want my kid to go hang out with those inmates. Okay. That's the other problem. All right, point taken. I'm going to give you a couple seconds to talk about weigh in, and we're going to go, we're going to go elsewhere. All right, so weigh in, weigh in is my new social mobile uh, environment, and you can go download it to your iPhone or, or, or your Android or get it on the web, W A Y I N. And the idea behind this was I have opinions, and I like to express them if you haven't noticed. And it's hard to have a one to many conversation, it's hard for uh, teachers to have a one-to-many conversation. It's hard for celebrities. It's hard for brands. It's hard um, for uh, government institutions. Everybody to have a one-to-many. Twitter is a one-to-many broadcast, but it's not a conversation. There's 13 million people following Obama on Twitter, but how many of them love Obama? How many of them hate? Well, we use evocative pictures with questions, uh, multiple choice questions with comments, with instant results. Real-time polling, real-time results. Try it out. And we have some very, very interested education institutions, including teachers, and Kariki is very excited about putting the W on every one of their learning assets. So when you put your mouse over it, up pops Q&A questions in real time with leaderboards, scoreboards, uh, badges, and all the rest of it. Because I think the one thing that is keeping uh, online education from happening is self-paced. And self-paced requires real-time scoring. And all of the real-time scoring gurus are too sophisticated. They want to understand how you learn. And I think the uh, Echo 360 person, we have iClicker, only you have iClicker in your pocket. It's called Weigh In. And you can create a question and an answer in 10 seconds with any picture you want. We'll search the web for you. Uh, and we have leaderboards, scoreboards, all the rest of it. It uses over the air, no hardware required, and it's free. Did I mention free? And you just use it. We have a professor at BU who uh, has, uh, she's putting a white paper together and she's not ready yet to let me share it with you. She gushes about how her lecture series exploded into debate, conversation, interest, activity. The students loved it because she would ask questions the night before her lecture about what she was going to talk about, which they would do research. The kids were asking their own questions, and the debate channels, uh, the debate on the channel in, and in the classroom just exploded. Uh, she never had to call on anybody again, and people who were shy could make their arguments in comments uh, on, on the website. So this is, uh, I think, a very powerful intersection, uh, and where the I clicker has gone gone from proprietary stuff to the standard off the shelf iPhone app. It's free. Download it. Try it out, uh, and start thinking about how you could use this. And uh, we're integrated into Facebook. You can broadcast to Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, and anybody can uh, create a channel. The one thing we will have new in very short order is uh, conditional access channels so that only your students can vote but everybody can view or only your students can vote and only the students can view or only the students can vote and only the teacher can view so we'll we'll have all of those different uh, uh, characteristics which right now are, the beauty of the public thing is everybody can vote and everybody can see how everybody voted and that's that's kind of cool too because I always believe that anonymity breeded irresponsibility okay I want to come back to the Valley culture. Uh, clearly, you are, you were, had been for a long time a Valley insider. Uh, you knew Steve Jobs. And at one point during his exile years, there was com public conversation, or at least speculation, that some was made a bid or was in the process of, of making a bid to buy, to buy Apple. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about Jobs in a lot of different forums, and not just the tech industry, over the last couple of months since his passing. Uh, what don't we know about Steve Jobs that, uh, that's been missing in this conversation? Um. Well, 
You know, I, I admire the heck out of Steve, and I think he's the, probably the greatest entrepreneur we've seen in our, our lifetime because he created Apple once and then created it again, and he did uh, Pixar and, you know, Next by anybody's. Uh, I mean, it wasn't successful compared to the other things he did, but how many of you wouldn't be proud to say, well, I did Next, it got bought by Apple and, you know, all the rest of it. <laughs> Uh, so he's a pretty pretty amazing guy. I'm I'm hoping uh, I'll uh, live long enough to challenge him this, with Sun and with Kariki and with Wayne someday. And I'm still chasing that demon, but he got a head start by not going finishing his degrees. But uh, <laughs> um, All right, so had you been in India with Steve, the world would look very different. Yeah, is right, that right, right. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, what what I will tell you is that he's not a great technologist. Anybody who's used his stuff, seen the innards, had to reboot, had the administrative challenges, all the rest of it, it, it's not great stuff. What he brought to consumer technology was an understanding that you could turn this into fashion. And he really was one of the great fashion designers of all time. And he had all the characteristics and mercurial of a, I don't know what they're like, but a Pierre Cardin or somebody like that who was a fashion designer and he looked at the fit and finish and they were pretty. And it, it felt nice and the, the icons were, were nice, all the rest of it. I can't stand the stuff. Give me my old Sunray, my thin client <laughs> with my Unix command lines. And I was thrilled to death because it always worked. I never had to fudge with it. I never lost, never had to reboot, never had to get the toothpick out. It was a very, but this is way prettier. And that's what he really brought. He was also very good at understanding new business models, but he's not unique in that. But the iTunes business model, he was very good at. So he took fashion and business models, and I always argued if he could have taken Bill Joy and Andy Bechtelsheim uh, and brought together, because you know what Sun did really well is we invented core stuff that you don't really understand, like uh, NFS, like uh, we, we were the first company to put TCP IP on every computer we ever shipped. I think it was 1998 before Microsoft finally put TCP IP into their operating system. I mean, think about that. We did Unix with Solaris. We did um, uh, Java. We did, so, we did that really hardcore, hard stuff, but it wasn't considered pr pretty or sexy. And you, don't, you used it, you just didn't know you were using it, and it's what made stuff work. But what Steve did so well was he made everybody comfortable. And you know what? This is the first thing my mom has ever used. And, and I, I love him for that. But it's a piece of crap, technically. You know? <laughs> you know, it could be so much better, and it is so wrong, and it is so proprietary that it doesn't work with anything else, which is why I have this, this, and a Mac, and our whole family does, and my, my wife spends 90% of her time being ch you know, chief administrative officer. Uh, for our equipment, so that. But you know, he he was a genius. He was a great entrepreneur. He was clearly the best fashion designer we've ever had in consumer, and uh, he he did some pretty interesting things with business models. Although, um, I just wish he shared more, and opened the interfaces up on that stuff. He must have missed that third year college course. He as missed well. that. That's a yeah. That's a well. That's. That, that's what the you know, tenured professors and, and public sector union teachers will teach you about communal things. All right. So I want to open this up. <laughs> We're going to open this up for a couple of questions, and I'm going to come back with one last question to Scott. So if you would, as we've done in the past, stand and deliver. Tell us who you are, where your affiliation, so we can make all the inappropriate inferences about what you're about to ask. Let's begin with the gentleman in the gray suit and the gray hair. Uh, John Nelson, California State University, Monterey Bay, and uh, uh, Cricky's great. Thank you. Um, Verizon has uh, their Thinkfinity uh, in the Silicon Valley. I think you have Lesson Plan Utopia. We have what you're doing. Is there any chance we could get all these guys together on the same page? Uh, I, I would love to. All of our infrastructure software, we'll share it all with anybody. We're not in a competition. That's the difference between .org and .com. We'd, we want everybody to steal all our stuff, you know, come get it. Um, you know, we actually, we, we actually are building some revenue models because fundamentally with trickle, trickle up poverty, the, the, charity tra uh, the charity class is basically disappearing. 
So we're having to find some self-funding revenue models, uh, which means we are uh, finding for-profit organizations that are using some of our stuff and we charge support pricing and that sort of thing. But we're happy to work with and, and eager to work with any and everybody to share interfaces, ideas, and content. And why, why haven't they been happy to share and work with you? What, what do you think the barrier is for them uh, to? Because th their stated goal is what you stated. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Everybody's busy. Um, could, could you go and then report back to us, maybe sort of in the next class? I could do that. I All could right. do that, absolutely. That's great. Next question, please. Hi, I'm Mike Goldstein, uh, Dow Lonis, Scott. A long time ago, uh, you were involved in creating Western Governors University, and which at that time was supposed to be the breakthrough that would transform American higher education, competency-based learning, get rid of the courses, get rid of the campuses, uh, let students learn what they need to learn and then test to see if they've got the competencies and put that all together and provide them with the certification. If the certification is something like an industry that changes, you give it a lifespan and say after five years you've got to get it again. Right. Why hasn't that become the future of higher education? So I was the angel investor for Western Governors University. Uh, Levitt and Romer were a couple of governors that came to me and, and Susan and I funded that thing, and uh, just the, the seed funding, the angel, and, and, and if you go look at the numbers, it is off the charts. It is just doing spectacularly. It has grown like crazy, uh, and I gave the um, commencement speech there uh, a few years ago. It brought tears to my eyes. It was so exciting to see what it's done. It is probably one of the biggest education secrets, and, there, and, and, and uh, I, I encourage you all to go uh, actually research and look at the growth charts on that thing. It is, it is, it is spectacular. You can only grow things so fast because there still is headcount related stuff with it. It isn't, you know, just a self-paced. They, they actually take care of the students, but they don't force them to uproot their lives and, and move and, and go someplace. I wish all schools would take that model on. And I would argue that the biggest impediment in higher education um, is the admissions committee. Because, you know, the last thing my kids need is to go away to school to learn, like, non-classroom stuff. They, they got, I want to raise my children, and I think I've raised them, and by the time they leave, they're, they're pretty well organized around what's right and wrong and all the rest of it. But uh, what I believe schools should do is have a zero, no admissions group. Everybody can come in and take all the classes online. They can see all the lectures, they can take all the tests, all the rest of it. And you can do it for a very low fee. Now, what they do is they offer uh, certificates of, you know, I actually give a degree to the top 300 if that's what they want, and then they charge a big bag of money for that. And only the people who pay the money for the degree. Or maybe they charge uh, a royalty for on your earnings for the next 10 years, and maybe if they did that, they would actually teach you something that would allow you to get a job. Uh, but there, there's, a, there's gotta be a way better model than the endowment, the tenured professor, and the, uh, the tuition costs that are escalating at way higher rates than our healthcare costs are rising. And, and so I would argue there's, there's gotta be a lot better models, and I think the Western Governor's model is one that is, is winning big time, as are a lot of the for-profit models that everybody's trying to shoot at. So back to your 17-year-old. Would you send your 17-year-old to get a degree from Western Governors? Absolutely, if he wanted to go out and get a job and get his degree at night at Western Governors, absolutely, because he'd make more money than he'd have to pay in tuition uh, and he'd be learning, he'd be learning stuff at work that would apply to helping him learn stuff at school. And I, I will tell you, I went to Harvard. I got an economics degree. I would say 10% of what I learned there ever had any, any impact on me in my professional life or my personal life. Right, Harvard got you into the door in a lot of places. It's the it? greatest brand in the world. That's why if I get in and I turn them down, I can still put on my resume, I got into Harvard. Here's my acceptance letter. That would be my resume. That would be my transcript. I got in. 
and I turned them down. I mean, that's what I, I mean, that's the conversation I had with my son. And so I, 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 asked, I asked my 13-year-old, I said, tell me what technology you use. Google, Wikipedia, dictionary.com, uh, wordreference.com, and Athena, which is kind of the learning management, uh, which kind of doled out his homework assignments uh, and had content that could be uploaded and, and delivered to him from his school. And Athena was just the school name of the little kind of learning. It's a little curriki inside of, inside of his school. And, and that's the technology he uses. Isn't that interesting? Uh, my, my, uh, he's now 16, uh, a junior, was trying to learn about orbitals. I don't know what orbitals are about, but I think, is that chemistry? Uh, yeah, it's, it's things going around. And his teacher literally had tried to teach his class for a week about orbitals. And he came and he said, Dad, I don't get it. Nobody gets it. Nobody. I've called all my smartest classmates. Nobody understands what this guy's talking about. I said, well, go to Kariki and search on it. He searched on it, found a Sal Khan video in a Khan Academy, came screaming out of the, Dad, I got it, I got it. Five minutes, this guy taught me more than this teacher had been able to teach in a full week. And I think that... You know, being able to apply that kind of technology. He called three of his buddies. They all watched the video. Boom, the class moved on because of Saul Khan. I think that's very powerful. And, and you know, there's nothing, there's no normative, it's just, you know, there's no special, you know, learning management systems or any, we get way too tricky, which is why I think this formative assessment tool that is zero polling fatigue, zero authoring fatigue, uses standard off the shelf and is free and anybody can do it, including the student. This kind of thing is gonna blow away the whole assessment programs that you see these massive proprietary API write to my stuff and then I own your data kind of thing is, is, is gonna be uh, very, very, uh, we're, old school. We're going to take a last quick question, and it's going to be a last one and a quick one, right? Sure. You are? Uh, Patrick Wilson with the Semiconductor Industry Association. And uh, my question, actually, you've said a lot of controversial things, but one thing I was curious about, I, I liked it. Actually. Really? Were you <laughs> controversial? I, That's what I was I named my first I son. Up. I named my first son Maverick. Yeah, huh? <laughs> After Sailor Palin. No, no she doubt, liked but. Tom Cruise. Um. <laughs> was it call sign? That wasn't my fault. That doesn't count in my time. But uh, my question is about for-profit <laughs> for profit universities. There's a, a group put together with some of your Silicon Valley friends, actually, that create a for-profit university that has the goal to create 10,000 engineers, new engineers, at a for-profit university. Uh, they want to turn everything on their head. They are looking at what Olin has done and others. I just wonder what you think of creating engineers into that kind of a way. I, I couldn't be more excited. And I'm telling all my kids, you know, become engineers, learn Mandarin and be good kids. And you know, you can't help but be hireable from that perspective. Uh, and I wish I'd had an engineering degree. I didn't even know, I literally, I grew up in a world where I didn't even know, I, don't, I blame my parents, they didn't know you could be an engineer, you could be a doctor or a lawyer, or be a businessman like your father. Um, and it, it, I, I just think engineering is absolutely a critical, uh, I had a, a good buddy, you can follow him on Twitter, John Backus, B-A-C-K-U-S, and he, he's, he just wrote a blog article that he believes that if the government gives money to a school, some percentage of the kids' uh, education, the core, has to be in STEM. And that we gotta, we gotta start funding that. I mean, if we're gonna, I don't believe in this, but if you're gonna, if you're gonna have public education, I think, We've really got to over rotate, and and if you look at, go do some of the research. Look at the school and look at some of the ridiculous. I will tell you, seventy percent of the majors are ridiculous at today's. That there's no job in the world you could hire these people into, where what they have learned is, if if they're really interested in that, let them do it online, let them do it on their own time, but let's not do it on the national nickel. It's just ridiculous. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I applaud them, and, and uh, you know, they're, they're welcome to stand on the shoulders of all the technology inside a curriculum and use way in because we'd like to support that kind of effort. Anyhow, thank you all oh, for staying. Wait, I'm taking one last question. All right. All right, so technology is often described as a young person's game, and I'm looking around the room and I see a lot of gray and thinning hair that suggests age. 
Uh, Lou Gerstner, when he went to IBM with no technical background, famously hired a bunch of younger people and sort of did reverse mentoring. Um, you are, I would guess, a little older than you were at the time of funding, you know, sort of starting Sun. What's a good strategy for those of us with gray and thinning hair or colored hair to sort of stay current in a world that's moving quickly? I think you, you, the way I do it, quite honestly, is Twitter. And I follow people who point me. It's a great clipping service for things that I want to follow. Some of it's the San Jose Sharks, but <laughs> a lot of it is on technology. So I follow really smart people who put me onto articles and things like that. When it was really easy when I was CEO because I had my CTO literally every few weeks, I would have him take three hours out of my schedule and he'd bring in the super bright people on a particular topic and their whole goal was to train the CEO. I used the guys that this was important for me to know it's because it was like going to technical school with the brightest and most interesting people on the most cutting it was I should have been paying them I would have I would have given half my salary just to keep doing that stuff just to listen but it was also valuable as CEO to be able to be current and uh, that sort of thing I'll give you one last idea I was talking to the CEO of EMC and I said run a channel and force all your employees to subscribe to it and they're getting into big data and the big data programming environment is Hadoop just ask a simple question of all your employees. What is Hadoop? Give them four answers, one of which is correct. They'll either vote the correct answer immediately or they'll be smart and they'll go out on the internet and search Hadoop, figure out what it is and then vote correctly or they'll guess wrong and now you have who's on the top of your list for your next layoff. But with a very simple free, no extra charge thing, he has now traded his entire company on Hadoop. And how else can you do corporate training quicker, faster, easier, more effectively, and set up your next layoff? So, and, and, it's, and it's free. And it's free. Did and I mention that? All right. So, okay, anyhow, you'll join me in thanking Scott for joining thank us this you. afternoon. Thank you.